Pastor got his eternal life, y'all. This once again, this once again, the great reversal. Many who were first will end up last, and last will end up first. What people thought would kill us just brought us alive. It's, it's a great reversal. It's the great reversal. Anybody that heard Pastor preach always heard him declare that greater is coming. Yeah. Pastor used to walk across his very pulpit and say, what if everything I did was to lay a foundation for those who are to come to build? He always told you guys, what my children will do will make what me and my wife did look like what? Child's play. He even formed us. He let us know. He told us. Like I say, he declared greater from the beginning. And so where are we at right now? Me and Pastor, we spoke about transition. And he said transition is like an elevator at the halfway point of the building. When the doors open up, you step on. But whether or not you go up or down depends on the button that you push. We're in a state of transition. We're sitting on the elevator, and we have to push the button. And the button has to be up. Because how many of you guys know, if you sit on the elevator and you don't push a button, it takes you somewhere. Y'all ready to push some buttons? Y'all ready to push some buttons? Amen. And so I, I, know, I know all of you guys feel change inside of you. And just as I've seen my father deposited himself, parts of himself, in so many people. And they're starting to come alive. And I realize, you know what? We're all coming alive. And I'm saying, like, you know what? I honestly, I really can't meet, can't wait to meet the new yous. I really can't. And we're going to get everything done that he's planted in each and one of your hearts. Because I know every single one of you guys got a piece. And it's going to take all of us. And the last thing that Pastor reminded us about when he was teaching on transitions is to understand that there's a new reality. We're living in a new reality. And the last message that he was studying on uh, was on dreams and how to dream again. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to accept our new reality. We're going to understand that he put a foundation in us that did not go away. And that foundation was the word of God. And once the word of God comes alive in us, the wisdom you need to be able to handle multiplied problems you have, and we're gonna face everything with confidence because I'm gonna know we will not quit. Therefore, we cannot be defeated. Amen. So, we love you guys. Uh, we're planning an incredible celebration for Pastor. Um, tomorrow, and we're going to have a good time. Amen. Amen. And celebrate how he would celebrate. Y'all Y'all. Y'all. Uh, already know. Y'all already know. <laughs> Amen. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dollar. Amen. Hello, everybody. 
Uh, I just want to echo, Brian, uh, we are so excited. You've heard me stand back here many times and say, I am so excited that I don't even know why. But uh, this morning when we were driving to church, I looked at Angela, my goddaughter, and I said, Angela, I'm so excited. That's because it's what Brian said, that Greg prepared us. And the only thing I wanted to know from God is, what direction do you want us to go in? And so um, I, was, I was praying, meditating for a couple of days. And so finally, I realized that what God was doing uh, is he was talking to Brian. He was telling Brian everything the church is supposed to be doing. He was telling Brian the direction of the church. Um, Greg uh, went home to be with the Lord on Monday. Tuesday morning, I got up and God spoke to me some things concerning who he was and who he, who he is to all of us. Then Brian showed up at my house and he said, Mom, Dad, not Dad, but God told me this, this, this. I mean, he put things in place. He said, God showed me this person, that person. And then he told us everything and the positions all of our children played in the role of the church. And uh, then I eventually realized, I said, you know what? God is not telling me how the church should go. God is telling him how the church should go. And that reminded me of a conversation Brian and I had about six years ago. And I looked at him and I said, Brian, um, you know you're supposed to hold a particular position. And he said, out of respect, because Brian is very respectful and honorable. He said, um, Mom, I can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, I believe those things belong to my older brothers. And he said, I will not, I will not do anything to dishonor them. And so I just looked at him and I said, Brian, what if you are the Joseph in the family? And so he didn't want to receive it then. <laughs> so uh, when Brian was made assistant pastor and COO of the church, he made sure he talked to his brothers first before he took the position. And so after having conversation with them, they said, Brian, we know that's your position in the church. And so therefore, Greg kind of reprimanded him a little bit about having false humility and just do whatever it is. <laughs> I told you, my children work well together and I enjoy listening to them and hearing what God has to say through them because Greg poured so much in us that we, people call me, I find myself ministering to other people. It's like, why are you calling me sad and tears run? That is not what's happening in this household. Every time we get together, we talk about what he did and how he brought us to this point and how he knew exactly what was going to happen. So our family was not uh, ill-prepared, but we are very prepared to see that this vision comes to pass. Very prepared. Amen. You preaching? I'm preaching. <laughs> so so in, in light of that, uh, as of today, we want to make it real clear. Uh, for the next 30 days, uh, Brian will be the interim senior pastor. And then at the end of 30 days, myself and others will be coming down of the men of God and we will officially install and ordain him as the senior pastor of the building. We are. Uh, uh, um, I have no doubt. He just keeps blowing my, he blows every, I just, when I look at him, I still see the kid running around everywhere. And, and I am, his, his father uh, has already prepared the way. He's spoken to everybody, but everybody knew all we needed was, it was the word of the Lord to confirm it. And it is confirmed. And so we will make it official. I think the date was May the 7th. Um, the Sunday of May the 7th, where I will bring an apostolic team down. We will lay hands, speak the word of the Lord, do all of those wonderful things to celebrate the birth of the truth nation, what y'all call it? RTM, RTM, RTM nation. 
Y'all yeah, get it right, RPM Nation. And uh, I, would, I would ask that you will allow them rest uh, for the next week uh, uh, and, and to, to just rest and recuperate and restore. And everybody knows their business. You know what you've been anointed to do. You know you've been called to do. You've already heard it clear that when the, when the pastor's not here, that's when you go to work and make sure you're here to do what need to be done because no leader knows his success or failure uh, until, he's not, until he's not here. In, in a leader's absence, that's when you know how successful you are. And uh, this is a very, very successful ministry. All of the sons and daughters of this ministry will be here. Uh, it'll be a family reunion on that day as we come and celebrate the continuation to the next level like you ain't never seen it before. <laughs> never seen it before. And one other thing, you know, somebody thinking, well, you know, uh, he's 31, I know, because he's the exact same age as our church. But I'm like, well, what, Harry, I was 20-something. 20, 20 yeah, 24. So excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're surrounded by a company that's in it, not just for this week, but for the rest of your lives. We in it to stay. So, uh, congratulations. And uh, thank God you know how to do what your mama tell you to do, boy. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> I'm going to be finished at about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Okay. So, Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And, Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, turn and greet two or three of your neighbors and you may be seated. Amen. Well, I'm going to be like coffee this morning, hot, black, and quick, okay? <laughs> How many of you were able to join us this past Wednesday? Let's see where we are. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to continue with that, except I ran into some other stuff as a result of it. And uh, I tell you what. You guys were so greedy on Wednesday. We could actually stay here for three hours on Wednesday. I'm going to tell you that. But uh, I want you to go with me to the book of Luke chapter 16. And, and I want to give a, a, a quick little summary here and then we'll pick up from where we left off. I think this is really, really going to bless you. We're talking about uncovering the spirit of mammon. And this morning I call it unmasking the spirit of mammon. And you'll see why. In Luke chapter 16... Verse one, and he said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man. Oh, I love this. Okay, so I can. Oh, we good. All right. Because I, I don't have to put my glasses on this morning. <laughs> and he said, unto, said also unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Verse two. And he says, and he called him and he said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship for thou mayest be no longer a steward. So a steward is a manager over the goods and uh, property and riches of another person. And so this, the context of this is so important because the application of a scripture is going to be based on the context context that you find that scripture in. You just can't lift the scripture out of its context and just say anything. That's the quickest way to lead to some kind of deception. So you have to consider 
the scripture and the application of that scripture within the context that it is found. And so we're talking here about a steward who uh, who was not being faithful with his Lord's money. OK. And so we go here to verse three and he says, then the steward said within himself, what shall I do for my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship? I cannot dig and to beg. I am ashamed. So he's calculating. Wait a minute. I'm getting ready to lose my job. He says, I cannot dig. Now he could dig. There was nothing wrong with his physical ability to dig. He just didn't want to. And then he said, uh, and to beg, I'm not ashamed. Well, he should have thought about that before he starts stealing the money. OK. And then he goes to the next verse and he says here, I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so now he comes up with a plan. Verse five. And he says, so he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much oweth thou unto my Lord? Now, check this out. You're talking about unjust steward. Now he's negotiating a deal with money that's not even his for his own future benefit. How many of you know this is not a faithful steward? Verse six. And he says, and a hundred measures of all. And he said to him, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then verse seven says, then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score. So he's cutting a deal, hoping that if I can cut a deal with these guys, when they see them in trouble, they might help me out because they remember the deal that we cut with one another. Look at the next one. He said, and the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. I mean, I mean, that's a strange statement. Why would you commend somebody that's stealing from you? It's like if you get home early and see a thief coming out the window, you want to congratulate him from stealing your flat screen TV. No, what he was saying was, you know, we've got to understand that, you know, some people don't understand that money should be used for the future and it's now being used for your present day lust. And he says sometimes the children of darkness, because they have 401k and they have savings, are a lot more wiser than the children of light who figure, well, I'm not going to save anything for the future because when I die, I'm going to heaven and everything's going to be all right. And so he goes here to verse nine. And he says, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, that word fail means to die. When you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. And so he says, there's going to come a time where if you'll, you'll, you'll understand how to use money correctly, there's going to come a time that even in your eternity, you're going to meet people that will honor you because of what you did for them while they were on the earth with you. Then verse 10, and here it goes. He that is faithful or can be trusted in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in the much. Now, I'm sure you've heard this, but here's the problem here. When he uses the word least, he's not using the word coming away from the context of this, this, this story. He's not saying stuff like, well, you know what? If you want to have a uh, big authority one day, then you're going to have to be faithful with the little authority one day. That is true, but that's not what he's talking about here. In the very context of this chapter, he's talking about a steward who was not faithful with his Lord's money. And Jesus now takes verse 10 and applies it to the context of this chapter. And when he said that you're not faithful, he that is faithful with the least, he is calling the money that the context just talked about the least. He's not setting up a, con a, 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 a category that you can just fill in with anything. You can fill a lot of things in that category. I mean, you can you can you can fill a whole bunch of things in the category of the least. But he is not using the word least as a word to talk about a category. He is calling the money the least. He is saying money is the least. And what he says is, if you can, if you can be faithful with money, the least, then you're going to be faithful with the much. Now, money is not the much because he just said it was the least. So money can't be the much. So he is saying that if you can be faithful and trusted with money, 
then you can be faithful and trusted with everything else. Healing, deliverance, relationship. He says, but if you're unjust with money, then you will most likely be unjust with the rest. See, the problem in the church is we never resolve the issue that when Jesus used the word least, he was referring to money and not a word to refer to a category. Because most church folks don't want to have nothing to do with money because they can't understand what in the world Jesus got to do with money. I don't want to go to no church that talk about no money. Jesus wants you to have peace. He wants you to have a good relationship. He wants you to be healed. Yeah, he does. And he said, all that's going to come if you have the trust that can handle the smallest area in the kingdom of God, money. You're dealing with money when you use your faith with money, you're using your faith for the least area in the kingdom of God. And what he's saying is, if you don't have enough faith and trust for the littlest area of the kingdom of God, you deceive yourself into thinking that you have faith and trust for the bigger things in the kingdom of God. You over here trying to get healed and you can't even, you can't even trust God where a dime of a dollar is concerned. Now you over here saying, I can trust God to heal me for cancer. He says, no, you can't. You can't even trust me in the least. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand in the New Testament, when you see Jesus talking about money, it is mo it is all of the time. Jesus, when he talks about money, it's an issue of trust Amen. because he knows there's only one thing in this earth that has gotten the trust of men more than him. And that is the area of money. Listen to me carefully because the money is not the problem. But, you, you know, people who say, well, Jesus has nothing to do with money. Listen to me. You remember in Mark chapter 12, the story of Jesus standing by the treasury and looking in the treasury to see how people give. Now, wouldn't that offend you just a little bit if somebody was looking to see what check you're going to write and what you're going to put in the bucket? I mean, you would be sitting there like, you know, excuse me, can I help you? But there was Jesus in Mark chapter 12, standing by the treasury, looking to see what they gave. And Jesus said, the rich people there gave much. But then he said, there was a widow woman there that gave two mites. And then it was a lesson. He's trying to show his disciples. He's saying, guys, come here. Let me show you something. This woman here has given more than everybody that gave that day. Well, she only had two mites, guys. So, you know, he wasn't talking about the measure of money. You know, he wasn't talking about that. She gave more money than the rich men. She didn't. Go, she didn't give more money than the rich men. They gave much more than what she gave. She only gave two mites. So, you know, so what was he talking about when he said she gave more than all of them? It wasn't talking about money. She didn't give more than all of them. So what was the measure? It was the measure of trust. Because what he said was the rich man gave, but they had some left over so they could still trust what they had left over. But the poor woman who gave the two mites gave all she had, even unto her living, had nothing to trust but Jesus. It's an issue of trust. Every time Jesus talks about money in the New Testament, it is an issue of trust. It is not an issue of the money. It is an issue of the trust. You know, my son went to pick my wife up. He says, you sure you don't need your bag? And, and I needed my bag because I need some money because I, I got my stuff in the bag. Give me a dollar. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> you ain't got a dollar? <laughs> okay, okay. All right, I, I just want to show this. All right, now watch this now. Here's the misconception. I'm going to put this money... Oh, Greg, thank you. We, we really have money, right? The money that's placed here is all by itself. That money is neither good or bad, holy or evil. That money by itself is neither good or bad, holy or evil. Because I hear people say, uh-huh, see, their life got, their life got messed up because they got that money. No, the money is neither good or bad. Are right, you listening to me? Now, this money being good or bad is going to be based on who comes by and picks it up. 
If a man who is under the influence of the demon of mammon picks it up, then mammon is controlling and influencing the use of this money. But if a man who is under the influence of God comes and picks it up and he'll do what God told him to do. Now, this money is under the influence of God. So money being good or bad is based on the influence that the possessor has. Not the money itself. And I'm saying this because you've heard people say, you know, bro Brother Dollar, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Now, you know, that's a lie, because if money was if, if money by itself was the root of all evil, then why are you getting up early in the morning, getting dressed, putting deodorant on and being being on time at work so you can go and earn some of that evil stuff? That's not it. That's not it at all. I tell you what's evil is, is when your wife got a weed that's barely hanging on to the rest of her hair. And can't even roll the window down to get no fresh air because that weed might just blow off. That's an evil thing right there. I tell you what else is evil is when it's when you is when it is a hundred degrees outside and you ain't got no money to get no air conditioning in there. That's an evil thing. But this standing by itself is not evil. If it is evil, then the possessor has to be evil. Does everybody understand that? Now, now follow me with the rest of this now. Now watch this now. <clears throat> so verse, verse 11 then confirms this. So Jesus said in verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least money is also faithful in that which is, which is uh, uh, much. And that's everything else. And he that is unjust in the least money is unjust also in the much. So if a guy can't be trusted with $2, don't make him the vice president and overseer over your billion dollar company. You already know what he's going to do. You found that out at two dollars. You can't trust him with two dollars. Verse 11, if therefore you have not been faithful or can be trusted in unrighteous mammon. Now, mammon, <coughs> mammon is, is an Aramaic word uh, that it derived from an Aramaic word which is translated riches or goods. So he is, Jesus is literally saying in verse 11, what I just explained to you. If therefore you have not been faithful or trusted with the unrighteous mammon or riches, who will commit to your what? Say that word again. Trust. Who will commit to your what? Trust. So the issue is trust. Can, can, Healing be committed to your trust. Do you have the trust to handle healing? Do you have the trust to handle reconciled relationships? Do you have the trust to handle deliverance? And what he is saying is, most likely, if your trust can't handle money, if you don't if you can't prove to yourself that you trust God where money is concerned, then you deceive yourself to think you can trust God where everything else is concerned. Because Jesus put everything based on, do you have enough trust to deal with money? If you can trust him where money is concerned, you can trust him with everything else. You remember the five talents, the two talents and the one talent? Mm -hmm. Five talent guy took the five. He could be trusted with it. Came back with five more. Two talent guy took and, and the Bible says it was his Lord money. It wasn't tap dancing lessons and singing lessons. He didn't give him five tap dancing lessons and two singing lessons. He said, this is the Lord's money. He took the two talents. He went and made two more. But you remember what the one guy did? The spirit of mammon caused him to hide that one talent because he didn't trust in that one area and had happened to deal with money. Jesus is not trying to teach you something, how to handle Wall Street. He's trying to teach you that trusting him is always going to be greater than trusting money. Even your money say that. In God, we trust. You ain't going to be able to lie yourself out of that when you get to heaven. Okay? So now watch this really quick. I got to move. Dear Jesus, man, I can get stuck on that scripture all two hours. 
And then he says, all right, you want an illustration? He says, and if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? And so he's saying here, listen, if you can't be trusted with money, then you're not going to be trusted with anything else. Just like if you can't be trusted with that, which is another man's, who's going to trust you with that, which is your own. And then here's my point. Here's what I want to get to. This is where I'll start preaching. Verse 13. So no servant can serve two masters. You can serve one or the other, but you can't serve both of them. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold to the one, despise the other. Watch this phrase. You cannot serve God who is a spirit. Watch this. And mammon. Now it changed. He is not talking about you can't serve God and money. He is saying you can't serve God and the spirit of mammon. Mammon is a spirit. Located in Revelation chapter 18, when Babylon had an unhealthy relationship with the material world, mammon is that spirit of the world. Mammon is a spirit that possesses most people. And lately it possesses over 95 percent of church folks and they don't even know it. There's a demon in 95 percent church folk and they don't even know it. Somebody says, are you saying that mammon is a demon? I'm not going to say that. I'm going to show you mammon is a demon. It is the most craftiest, sneakiest, under the radar demons ever. It is a demonic spirit that wants to influence your decisions where money is concerned. He says now to not serve God, you by default will serve the spirit of mammon. So you're going to have to make a choice or one will be made for you. Now, when I said this very interesting thing, those of you, you've already heard this. So the shock value is over with. You, you, you did all that Wednesday. Woo, what? Law, oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> you went through all that. Everybody else did it silently. And right, now listen to some things about, about mammon. Mammon, the spirit of mammon. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve the spirit of mammon. How do I know if I'm even serving the spirit of mammon? Well, first of all, mammon tries to tell us that you don't need God. That's the purpose of mammon. Mammon wants to say to you, you don't need God. Mammon wants you to trust money more than you trust God. The objective of mammon is to get you to trust it more than you trust God. You see, you can serve mammon instead of serving God, but it's impossible to serve both at the same time. So money now will either have one spirit influencing its use. Either money will have the spirit of mammon influencing its use or money will have the spirit of God influencing its use. Now, listen to this very carefully. This is so, so important. How does mammon behave? Mammon is Satan who is in direct contrast to the spirit of God. Mammon is in direct contrast to the spirit of God. What do I mean by that? Mammon says buy and keep. God says sow and reap. Mammon says cheat and steal. God says give and receive. You see, mammon will, will, will try to convince you that if the price is right, it's okay to cheat. Mammon is looking for servants. It wants to rule your life and take place and take God's place. Mammon tries to give you only that which God can give you. Mammon tries to give you your identity. Mammon tries to give you security. Mammon tries to give you significance. Mammon tries to give you independence. Mammon tries to give you power. Mammon tries to give you uh, influence. Mammon, Mammon wants you to think it can buy you a home. Money can buy you a house, but it can't buy a home. Money can buy medicine, but it can't buy healing. Money can buy you a friend for the night, but can't get you a lover for eternity. Can't do it. But mammon, mammon is selfish and God is generous. 
Mammon either tries to insulate us from life's problems or get us to dwell on them. See, mammon will work with you when you're depressed and you'll go to the mall and you and mammon will tell you, you, you know, you ain't got no money, but go and use that credit card and buy that dress you can't afford and watch mammon try to make you feel better. Mammon try to try to play the play, try to play to take the role of the Holy Spirit and comfort you and say, you don't need the Holy Spirit. You got some money here in this credit card and mammon will lead you down the road because mammon wants to get you in a ditch. See, mammon wants, wants you to have fun while you obeying it, but then it always leaves you in a ditch. But God will never leave you in a ditch because he's the one that'll find you in the middle of a pit and he'll get you up out of the pit place your feet on solid ground and put a new song in your heart amen mammon either tries well mammon is not our security god is our security i said mammon's not our security god is our security but you see most people right now today when they have a problem they don't go to god and say god what do you want me to do mammon says no all you need is some more money all you need is some more money I shared this Wednesday night. You come up and you'll say, you know what? The Lord, hallelujah. You know how we do testimony. Thank you. Aya. <laughs> come outside and tie my tie. The Lord told me to join this church. Hallelujah. And he's given me a special assignment. E little bobo show. And, and I'm to be here for the rest of my life. Oh, hallelujah. And then you get a call from your job from Seattle and say, we're going to pay you 50000 more dollars if you come up here to Seattle. And then you're talking about, Pastor, the Lord has really been working. <laughs> hallelujah. He gave me, ayasasapapa. He gave me a raise and now I'm moving. Hallelujah. I'm moving to, to Seattle. Listen, isn't that amazing? That mammon now sounds like religion. And what God couldn't get you to do, mammon got you to do immediately. And if you'd have just stayed where the call was, you would have seen God do something much more than what money could have ever done. But what you don't see is the end of those testimonies. That you done stepped out of the will of God, went on up to Seattle, bragging about your new car you can afford, but now you ain't in the word no more. You're not surrounded by good fellowship no more. You're not completing the will of God no more because you're out of place. And even though you have a $50,000 raise, you're broke because you're out of the will of God. Now you're in a ditch. Now you're sad. Now you're drinking again. Now you're fooling around and you can't figure out what happened. What happened is mammon has deceived you and you are now a part of Mammon's congregation, the first church of Mammon. Mammon wants you to do something wrong just to get the money. If we think that money can solve our problems instead of God, then the spirit of Mammon has influenced you. When was the last time you went to God first? You know, why, why, why is it in our minds the only way we're going to get out of this is money? Oh, honey, I've had God do things in my life. He didn't need no money. He just showed up with an abundance of favor. Oh, uh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with you as a believer having money. The problem is you can't let a spirit of mammon get on you when you got it. Because if, if, if God is on your life, then you're going to do what God tells you to do. Watch this. Give. That's what he tells you to do with money. Give. That's what he tells you to do with money. Give. Now, if some of you feeling funny when I'm saying that, you are giving evidence that you have the spirit of mammon right now on the inside of you. That demon is, is working his way up every time I say that. Give. Look at that. <laughs> you, know. now, you throw up. Now, make sure you clean it up before you leave. Mammon will use you and exploit your, your relationship with your friends if the price is right. And like I say, people don't have to get married because they're in love. If the, if, the, if the right amount of money in the bank, that woman will say, yes, I do. She will marry an ugly man. <laughs> mammon, will, mammon will cause you to marry ugly as long as you can marry rich. 
And I asked the question, what love got to do with it? <laughs> Mammon asked that question, what love got to do with it? You remember in Luke chapter 15, verses 12 through 28, and for time's sake, I'll go through this. You remember the story about the prodigal son? He wanted his uh, inheritance early. He got it. He was being influenced by mammon. He went and, and uh, parted and, and spent time with the wrong folks. Situation hit economically. He had no more money left. Found itself where the pigs were. So hungry, desiring to eat what they fed the pigs. Watch this. And once mammon has used you up and he leaves you in a pig pen, that's when you'll come to yourself. That's where a lot of people come to themselves. I don't want you to waste 30 years of your life before you come to yourself. I'm trying to tell you now. God is your source. Yes. Are you listening to me? Yes. He said, my father has servants that have a lot to eat and a whole bunch left over. If I can go home, maybe my father will receive me. See, he came to himself. Mammon wants to wreck you up and convince you that you need him in order to live. But thanks be unto God when he came back. His father heard he was coming and met him. And he tried his best. Oh, father, if you can just forgive me that I have sinned against you and, and, and against God. He said, go get go get a robe. But you don't understand. I really missed it. Go and get a, go get a, 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 a ring and put on his hands. See, God is ready to restore you. Amen. But today, are you ready to leave the first church of mammon and make Jesus your Lord and your savior? Amen. Amen. Now go with me to Luke to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Now that's the foundation of this, but now we're going to go through the Bible with the time we have left and just show you it's all over the scriptures. We're unmasking the spirit of mammon. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. You're familiar with this story. Rich young ruler here, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, master, all these I have observed from my youth up. He was lying. Nobody could keep the law. Not all of it. He was lying. And Jesus is getting ready to reveal to you the spirit that would tell this lie. He goes on here and he says, and he said, verse 21, then Jesus beholding him, he loved him. And he said unto him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, Give to the poor, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and take up thy cross and follow me. You see what the test was? We're getting ready to see where the influence comes from. Let's take what you have, the money. Let's take it. Do what I tell you to do with it. And then come and follow me. Come and follow me. Let's see how he responded to, to that request. And he was sad at that saying. Stop right there. He was sad at that saying. It's no different than in a lot of the churches when the preacher gets up and says it's offering time and they are sad at that saying. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Because the spirit of mammon has hold of them and is influencing their life. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, how hardly, what, what, let's finish. And he went away, grieved, because he saw giving as a loss instead of a gain. He went away grieved for he had great possessions. Or I'd like to say great possessions had him. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And so he had to clarify this because it sounds like you're saying whoever has money, they're going to have a hard time entering the kingdom of God. And, and the disciples, 
The Bible says they were astonished at these words. Well, if the disciples were broke like every church teaches, why would they be astonished at his words? They should have jumped up and said, whoopee, we broke, so praise God, we in. So Jesus clarifies this, and he said, uh, but Jesus answered again and said unto them, children, how hard is it for them that, watch this, trust. There's the issue of trust. Trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Trust is the currency of the kingdom, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. You cannot buy the favor of God. You can't buy it. Well, I'll tell you what, we've got five more minutes on the air. If you send in your $50, God's going to bless you. Bull, you can't buy no blessing. It's the favor of God and you can't buy God's favor. God's favor is not up for sale. If you could buy God's favor, it wouldn't be favor. His unmerited, undeserved favor can't be earned or bought. Well, how do I get it? I trust him. I believe I received it. I believe Jesus has already done everything that has been made available for me. It's already been done. I'm already healed. I'm already delivered. I'm already prosperous. I'm not trying to get God to do nothing. I believe Jesus already did it. And so trust is the currency of the kingdom. But the only way you can authenticate your trust is by giving. And mammon doesn't want you to give because it authenticates your trust that you trust God more than you trust money. And so what I say is I trust God so much, I am not afraid to give because I trust God. So I'm going to take this money and prove to myself that I trust God more than money by giving. Watch this. Go to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Mammon is the spirit of the world. <laughs> Mammon is the spirit of the world. Well, why don't you move America to America and become a part of the American dream? You know what the American dream is? It's Mammon. Why don't you come and fall in love with Mammon too? And you can do just like we do. Become a part of the first church of Mammon. I want God's dream. I love America. But I'm here in America to try to straighten out their dream. They're in a nightmare right now. Anytime you are more addicted to the spirit of Mammon, if Mammon can get you to do more than what God can get you to do, that's not a dream, that's a nightmare. Or it will be. Look what he says here. Honor the Lord with thy what? And with all the first fruit of thine increase. What will happen? Verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy press shall burst out with new wine. I want to introduce you to the cousin, the first cousin of mammon. You know what the first cousin of mammon is? Idolatry. Now, what is idolatry? Idolatry, if you don't understand it, you got to understand what honor is. So let's deal with honor first. Honor literally means the very literal definition of honor is to weigh in heavy, to carry weight. It means to carry weight to to uh, it means heavy weight. It also means first and priority. To honor God means that God carries more weight and weighs in heavier than anybody or anything. Amen. Amen. It says to honor your mother and father. To honor your mother and father means that their words will carry more weight than what they said on Facebook. You will allow the person honored to carry more weight in areas of your life. But notice here he said, honor the Lord with your what? With your what? Okay, somebody said, well, what is substance? Well, that's a spiritual thing. No, it ain't. It's money. It's capital. Capital that was, was earned and it wasn't unrighteously earned. In other words, we're not talking about money that you got from selling weed. <laughs> from righteous labor. All right, now listen. Honor the Lord with your money. Watch this carefully. 
To honor God with my money is to allow, watch this, God to weigh in heavier where the use of my money is concerned versus anything else. Now, here's what we've done. I did a series a couple of months ago on what the Apostle Paul, grace-based giving, what the Apostle Paul had to say about giving. And one of the things he had to say about giving was, at the first of the week, lay aside from your, from your earnings. Lay aside something for the Lord. Lay it aside. And what he was communicating was, Put God in first place. Don't wait to the, don't 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 let allow don't allow God to be an afterthought where your giving is concerned. Amen. And for most Christians, here's what it looks like. We get our check. And first of all, we try to live off 100 percent of our check when you should live off 80 percent. You live off 100. You know, you get one hundred dollars and you go out in hyper consumption and you spend every dime of that hundred dollars. Uh huh. When you should go out. And figure your life to live off 80 percent. Give God 10 and pay yourself 10. Amen. You try you still trying to do the hundred. Mm. And then when you do the hundred and somebody talk about giving the church. Well, I like to. But get your butt out the way now. <laughs> and what happens? You find yourself coming to church scratching for change because God's not honored. He's the afterthought. He's always the afterthought. And you know what happens? That's not honor. When you honor God, you on purpose set him up. You have made your mind up. You have intentionally decided I am a giver. And every time something come in, I'm going to set some aside for God. That's honor. You got him in first place. You're not going out, well, I got to pay this bill, I got to pay that bill, and baby need a pair of shoes, and look, he got a light bill due, he even got a gas bill too, telephone disconnect, oh, wait till my next paycheck, you're already on your next paycheck, and you just got that up. <laughs> and so what's happening, you're eating more than you're pl planning. And you keep eating and consuming more than what you're sowing. And you don't ever get out of it. Well, you don't understand, it's the white man. No, you can't blame the white man for this. <laughs> and it's, the, it's not just the black man either in this, in this situation. It's, it's, it's all color folks in this situation. We don't honor God. And yet we come to church like we do. Oh, hallelujah, like we honor the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. When's the last time you gave? Well, I don't give, but hallelujah. You, are you serious? I just showed you the connection between your whole life is with the giving of money and you keep wanting to act like it's just some preacher trying to come here and rip you off and your life stays the same, broke and pitiful and hurt and you're trying to believe God for stuff but your trust just can't handle it because you can't pass the test with it's little. It's like going in the gym and you can't lift the bar and you bragging about you're going to bench press 350 pounds. You're going around talking about you're going to climb Mount Everest and you can't even get that first step right. You can't do it. You're going in there bragging about, you know, I, I, I praise the Lord. I, I, I eat pork. I eat some pork chop. And you can't listen. If you can't handle pork chop, leave chitlins alone. <laughs> and that's what I'm trying to wake the body of Christ up to. Quit walking in deception. Let's honor God with our money. And if we can be trusted with the least, he can trust us in the much. Well, I just I just don't just don't see what money got to do with it. I know you can't see what money got to do with it because you blinded by mammon. You can't see. Well, you know, all preachers wanted your money. Oh, dear God. That's a that's a slogan straight from the house of mammon. All preachers want is your money. <laughs> but Mammon never says the places that are in his church. All the store wants is your money. All Tampa Bay Buccaneers want is your money. All the restaurants want is your money. You don't believe me? Take your family out to a restaurant today. Eat that food. 
What's that line they got all for all you can eat line? Buffet. Go to buffet. Eat that buffet. And then when it's come time to pay, say, y'all don't want my money. Y'all just want me to be full. And after they call and get the popo, they're going to show you that all they wanted was your money. They didn't care about you being full. But mammon wants to make it seem like, listen, it's the church you don't want to invest in. Stay away from them crooks, man. They'll get you every time. And oh, don't ever listen to somebody with a last name like Dollar. What? Real quick, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 10. I'm going to stop here. 1 Timothy 6 and 10. Are y'all getting this? Yes. All of these years, people have questioned the issue of money being taught in church. And today you're finding out if that test didn't pass, you're in deception with everything else. And you ain't got to listen to me. Just do a flashback of your own life. You who are not a giver, you who don't plan on giving, you who don't care about giving. The level of trust that you've released in the area of money is also the level of manifestation you will see in the area of every other area of your life. Amen. We always knew it was a difference. It was just preachers were too scared to say it. Look what he said in First Timothy. For the love of money. Look at there. The love of money is the root of all evil. Now, notice he didn't say money is the root of all evil. What's the root of all evil? Love. A wrong relationship with money is the root that will give way to the fruit of all evil. And what is specifically is the love of money? It is when you trust it more than you trust God. When you trust it, money, more than you trust God, you have a wrong relationship with money and to trust mammon more than you trust God. Mammon is the root of all evil. Before Judas went and uh, before Judas went, I, I believe it was in Luke 22, one through six. Judas went to cut a covenant of money to betray Jesus. The Bible says Satan entered into him. That was the spirit of mammon. But, you know, before Satan entered in him, before they cut the covenant, you remember the, the, the precious spices this woman bought? Yes. And it was Judas that said, these are expensive spices. Why don't you sell them and give the money to the poor? And the next verse said, not that he cared for the poor, but he was a thief that had the bag. So he didn't care nothing about the poor, but mammon was on him to say, I don't care nothing about the poor. I care about my bag with my money in it. Because greed wants to hold on to what you have and try to get some more to hold on to it. Are you listening to me? The love of money is the root of all evil. And so if you have a wrong relationship, will you, will you trust it more than you trust God? It's the root of all evil. Okay, a couple more. Uh, Matthew 6, 21. Matthew 6, 21. I don't know what we're going to do. I'll just probably preach the next service and just kind of preach to 4 o'clock or something. I don't know. <laughs> do the whole series in a day. And then if I don't finish the day, do it tonight. And then have midnight special. And if the midnight special don't work, we just have a shut in. <laughs> Not the sick and the shut in, the healthy and the shut in. Amen. I look at this for where your treasure is. Read it out loud with me. Ready for where your treasure is. How do you believe that scripture you just read? OK, so you know what he just said, right? He said, if I can find your treasure, I can locate your heart. You're not church folks. Are. We come to all oh, my heart is in God. Oh, my heart is in the word. Hallelujah. My heart is in Jesus. My heart is in Jesus. Thank you. OK, so we're going to authenticate that. I'll need two things from you. To find out where your heart is really located. Give me your calendar and give me 
your bank statement or your check ledger. Because whatever you, wherever you spend your money and whatever you spend your time, that's where your heart is. And so I take that calendar and I notice, okay, oh, I see this. Golf course tournaments, golf, golf course, clothing, golf courts, equipment. Oh, you spend Sundays at the golf course. Uh, Wednesday too. Mm, seemed like every time they had church, you had the golf course. Okay, so I know now. Say, I see where you're spending your time. Let me see where you're spending your money. Ooh, you spent that money for them tickets? Oh, you said you buy golf clothes every. Oh man, you got four sets of golf clothes. You bought a golf cart, dude. I think we found your heart. It's on the golf course. I think we found your heart. Wherever you spend your time and your money is where your heart is. Don't come telling me your heart's with God and then look at your ledger and you ain't gave nothing in five years and your heart's there. That's the biggest bunch of bull I ever heard. Or we look at your calendar and you only come to church on Easter. You might want your heart to be in the things of God. It's just not. And that will answer our next question. Who's influencing you? It don't take much. Jesus spoke to Peter, told him he had to die and get on the cross and die. And Peter said, no, Lord, you don't have to do that. And Jesus said, Peter, Satan, I rebuke you because what you said was not from God. You savor the things of men and you savor if not the things of God. So a, de a demonic influence can come that quick. That was the same chapter where, where God just said to Peter, he said, who am I? He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you bless Peter. You rock it now, boy. And on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And in the same conversation, he rebuked the demonic influence in it. So that means you can walk out of here saying hallelujah and go in the parking lot and be under the demonic influence and say something that doesn't line up with God's word if you don't understand how subtle this demonic spirit of mammon can be. Yes. Mammon wants to destroy you. It wants to keep you away from God's best. It wants to keep telling you and tricking you that money ain't got nothing to do with it. And as long as it does that and you obey, and you feel the way some of you are feeling right now, then you will never know the provisions that grace has made available to you because you keep choosing mammon over God. Somebody said, what did he, is he, did he teach on money this morning? Oh, I, I, I'm not teaching on money this morning. I'm teaching on trusting God. Amen. And that's all the time I got. Would you please bow your heads with me for a moment? <laughs> Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise. We honor you today, Lord. We choose you today. And we say within ourselves that we will never trust money over you. Amen. Never. We submit ourselves to you, God. You are our source. You take care of us. And we will authenticate our trust through our giving. Spirit of mammon, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You have no right to continue in these precious people in my life or in the life of anybody at the sound of my voice. We command you to cease in your maneuvers against the kingdom of God and the people of God. I command it now in Jesus name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands up and give God thanksgiving. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put them up. I want you to I want you to thank him. I want you to give him thanks. 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 There's something about thanking him. There's something about thanking him. Give him thanks right now. Give him thanks right now. 
Just thank us something about Thanksgiving. Thank you for what I receive. Thank you for what I understand. Thank you for what I got. Thank you for the truth that's been deposited. I'm never going to be the same again. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Come on guys, let's give God a big applause. Let's just praise him and thank him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks, buddy. Uh, yeah. Chris. Amen. Were you guys blessed? Amen. Amen. My my father, his his heart for people um, and his mission was to save souls and change lives across the world. And we have many plans that we're going to speak to you about how we um, intend on carrying out that legacy. But today, like I said, we would not be doing right to not give you guys an opportunity to have salvation today. And so Chris is going to share some words that God placed on his heart concerned about things that could truly honor my father, that would truly show honor for the life that he lived. Amen. Amen. Um, so, you know, I wrote Brian, I told Brian, uh, when we, as my dad was teaching about transition, I remember I just start from the start of the story. So uh, as my dad was teaching about transition, uh, I was sitting there and I believe the spirit of God told me to, he was like, write. A, he was like, I want you to write this. I want you to write a message about transition. He only told me two words. He was like, write about transitioning from death to life. And I thought to myself, that's a weird message. That's a strange thing to write because um, it's in the opposite direction of what we see. It's the opposite of what we believe uh, things are. And it's, uh, then, you know, first things are moving. My dad, my father died, and then the Holy Spirit was actually able to share more about it with me. And I want to look here at Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. Uh, I have it written down here so I can read it real quickly. It says, and one of the scribes came up to came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he talking to Jesus, seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so I was looking at that and I was thinking about it and crossing it with my father's life and thinking about what it is that God had done. And the thing is, we have always looked at salvation. We've, said, we've always presented, we've said it's a free gift, but we're always presenting salvation from the side of people who are saved. And when we are saved, we've come into Christ and we've discovered the unpassing glory and wonder and just gloriousness of Christ. We found life in Jesus Christ. Prior to that, we are dead. But when we are dead and we are under the spirit, influence of the spirit of mammon, the spirit of this age, the spirit of this world, we think we need money, we think we need clothes, we think we need cars, we think we need all of these things. When we look over at Christ, it seems like we are losing something. And so um, I'll read what I wrote down here. And it says, God actually wants everything for us to transition from death to life. We have to give up all of our lives. Now, I grew up in church. I've always been in church my whole life. I think we were there at World Changers the day that it started. But it, was un it wasn't until learning from my dad and being able to watch my dad and being able to see how he lived his life. We've all looked at him and he seemed like he was larger than life. He, he always glowed in a, in a particular, like in a different way. Even amongst Christians, you know, he comes to church and you're like, oh, that guy's different. Everywhere you went, you were like, that guy's different. The reason that my father was different is because he discovered 
that he had to give everything. He sacrificed his desires, his personal desires. He sacrificed his personal will. He sacrificed everything that he had to obtain what it is in Christ. And that's what salvation is. You drop all of everything. And it, it, it seems hard because you're, you're confronting this spirit that's a part of our day. It's a part of our world. It's a part of what it is. You know, you're confronting that spirit. You're confronting that spirit of mammon. You're confronting that spirit that's had complete grasp on us from the day that we're born. It tells us that we need self-esteem. It tells us we need to have the best clothes. It tells us we need to be in the, the uh, flyest outfit. I used to teach things, so it tells us we need to have the best outfits. It tells us we need to have all of these things, but it's lying. It is lying and it's leading us to death. We only have to look out at the world that we live in, in spite of all of its lies, in spite of everything that is said, it's not right. Even people in the world know that it is not right. And they're desperately wanting. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's in God. It's in Christ. It's in salvation. So if you're here today, oh, I'm sorry. So as we, after, I was trying to, as we, after my dad died, you know, of course you get a lot of messages. You get people saying, how can I honor you know, they, they, well, they don't say, how can I honor Pastor Paul? They say, anything you need, anything you want. Well, the thing that would honor my dad the most, the thing that would honor Pastor Poe the most uh, is that you free yourself from that spirit of man, that you free yourself from the spirit of this age, that you find life in Christ. And it's easy to go about. We can put on our best church clothes. We can do our best church things. You might say to yourself, well, I don't sin. I don't lie. I don't steal. I don't. But it's not about what you don't do. It's about what you've given up to get into Christ. And it's making that absolute break. So if you today know in your spirit that you haven't made that break, from what it is from yourself. You haven't made the break from making yourself the Lord of your life and you're ready to say, God, I want all of you. Because to get all of God, you have to give him all of you. So if you would like that today, that is salvation. That's what salvation is. So if you would like to be saved, um, what are we doing? Um, Raise your hand. <laughs> We'd like to talk to you. We'd like to pray with you uh, because it is a hard transition. It's not an easy transition. Anyone who tells you that it's an easy transition, that they go to the back, they pray, and then they walk out, and they're like, oh, yeah, that was awesome. Then they're probably lying. But that's why God has given us men and women of God. My father had passed a dollar who, when he went to make that transition, God gave him someone who could grab him and carry him through it. So we would love to carry you through that transition from death to life, from being a living dead person to being someone who is dead but alive in Jesus Christ. So if you would like to... Oh, oh I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Everybody stand. I, didn't, I don't know all the rules we do it different than you so <laughs> stand um if you've made that decision you can come up front uh if you need some help from right now you're like i'm standing here i don't know what to do i've been lying to people my whole life i thought i was saved i thought i had given it all but i i, I know there's something else i need to do right now grab your neighbor and walk up here with them turn to your neighbor ask your neighbor tell them if have you would you like to live today in Christ? And if you'd like to make that move, then move. Oh, calm it down, turn it down. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting hand signals. So, <laughs> uh, what else are we doing? Huh? Oh, if you would also like to rededicate your life, to the Lord today. You, you have, oh, thank you. 
you have made a, uh, you've already made a decision to live for Christ, but you haven't walked that decision. You haven't walked it out. You've had one piece here, one. If you haven't walked out that decision to live for Christ, then come on. We'd like to pray with you. We'd like to talk with you. We'd like to pray with you. And lastly, of course, you heard Brian declare with your pastor, Pastor Dollar, revealing truth nation. And what the church is, it's 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 nothing more than a group of people who want to walk with you. We all walk this walk in Christ. We all do it. We all have struggles. We all have things. And that's why God's called us together to be a body. And we walk together. 